Goedemiddag aan iedereen. Good afternoon to all. As the Secretary General of Synagrid, it's a real pleasure for me to welcome you to this first webinar. Synagrid is the federation of the Belgian grid operators for electricity and gas. On the 27th of January, Synagrid and all nine electricity and gas network operators received the title of SDG Voice 2021 from the Federal Minister for Climate, Environment, Sustainable Development and Green Deal, Mrs. Katabi. We are extremely excited about this because we see this nomination as a, an opportunity to further deepen the dialogue with our stakeholders and highlight the numerous opportunities of the energy transition. As SDG Voice, we've been given the mission to raise awareness with respect to the sustainable development goals and make them more accessible to our citizens and businesses so that everyone can can contribute to their achievement. Synagrid and its members therefore want to use various actions to make young people, households, companies and local authorities aware of the urgency of the energy transition. They also want to stress the importance of rational energy use and promote sustainable development. Ensuring that sustainable energy is accessible to all is really the raison d'etre for the transmission and distribution network operators. Together we work every day in order to achieve that transition to sustainable energy. We are ready to shape tomorrow's energy world together, a world in which everyone can support the energy transition and no one is forgotten. Synagrid and its members are currently working on a project to achieve our mission of SGD Voices. As part of this project, we will organize a number of webinars. In our candidacy, we had indicated that we wanted to work around some of these 17 sustainable development goals, and we've picked out eight. Our first webinar will tackle objective one, no poverty, because for the distribution system operators, this is an important challenge, but also objective 10, reducing inequalities, because there we also have a role to play together with the authorities. Ladies and gentlemen, energy poverty is a real challenge for Belgium. According to the barometer on energy and water of the Royal Baudouin Foundation, more than one family out of five lives in energy poverty in our country. And this share has hardly changed since 2009. Energy poverty refers to a situation in which a person or a household faces particular difficulties in meeting their basic energy needs. The principle, leave no one behind, is central to the 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development and is also part of the coalition agreement. Federal objectives to combat poverty should be brought in line with regional objectives as the competencies of the regions are important in this area. Now, the distribution network operators have an important role to play in the field of energy poverty because they are legally recognized as social suppliers. They also have social inclusion and the fight against energy poverty in their strategic plans. They want to better assist customers in difficulty and they also want to better understand the situation of protected customers. They work together with universities in order to better um, get an insight into the context of energy poverty and respond more effectively. It should be noted, however, that the liberalized market, which works very well for a majority of customers, is less suitable for more precarious groups. The distribution system operators, as public actors, wish to use their knowledge as a social provider to fight solutions for these difficult situations together with other social actors. The distribution network operators also wish to go beyond what they are already doing today through innovative projects, for example, such as local energy communities, where social housing companies, distribution network operators and universities work together to design inclusive solutions, which is important 
within the context of the energy transition, but also within the context of the just transition. And Mrs. Fauconnier of Sibelga will later on explain the vision of the network operators better. Ladies and gentlemen, the fight against uh, energy poverty is part of what is commonly called the just transition, which is about interventions that are needed at the social level as part of this transition to a more sustainable energy. Now, just transition is an important uh, part also of the European Green Deal and the National Action Plan. We will have the pleasure to be able to listen to the representative of the Minister for Sustainable Development, uh, Mrs. Zakia Katabi. The Minister will not be here today and she sent us a short video and afterwards Mrs. Ariane Giraneta will take the floor. We will also get uh, uh, Mrs. Fauconnier who will then speak about uh, the network operators and we will also have an intervention by a representative of the European Commission in charge of the just transition, Mr. Iro Ayo. Our ambition is to make the energy transition a success by leaving no one behind. And our slogan in this field, thank you very much for your attention. And after the video, we will hear uh, Mrs. Ariane Giraneza, then Mrs. Fauconnier, and then finally also Mr. Iro Ailio. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello, everybody. I would first of all like to congratulate the organizers Synergrid and the electricity and natural gas grid operators for having been awarded this title. I am extremely glad to be here today and the occasion of your first webinar as uh, SDG Voices. I think that uh, it is extremely important to work in this area to achieve the sustainable development goals, not just the um, evident one on energy, number seven, but also number one on poverty, 10 on equality, 12 on sustainable consumption and production, and 13 on the climate. And it is because the SDGs have such a complete and diverse agenda that uh, it is a conscious choice that we've made to also include uh, players of different sectors. Energy poverty is an emergency. It is important that we evolve towards a low carbon society in a just way so that uh, it is possible for even the most vulnerable families to meet their energy needs. We have the transition and social justice that are inextricably linked and that are really at the centre of this policy because we need to respect the environmental threshold, the limits of the planet, but also the social thresholds, the basic needs of the population. And that is where the two major principles of the European Green Deal come in. Do no harm on the environmental level and leave no one behind on the social level. Just transition it has been recognized on a national but also on an international level by the states, by the corporations, social partners, NGOs, public authorities, such as the International Labour Labour Organization, also in the context of the Paris Agreement, the Just Transition Silesia Declaration, the European Green Deal, or also the Just Transition Fund. It is also part of our National Action Plan on Energy and Climate. So we really need to flesh out this concept and we really need to make it a reality. And it is together that we will be able to do that. So thank you very much for opening this dialogue today during this webinar. Hello, everyone. I am Ariane Raneza and I represent the government here to briefly talk about what energy poverty really means on a federal level. I do not have to tell you that we live in a complex countries where competencies are organized at different levels. So what do we have on a federal level? Now, to explain that, it is important to really understand the drivers of energy poverty. Energy poverty is... Uh, closely linked to wages. People who do not have very high wages might uh, 
have problems with their energy uh, provision. Also, the uh, housing facilities will play a role and, of course, also the energy prices. Now, in order to do something about this, as uh, the public authorities, it's important to do something about one of these three levels. Now, with respect to the wages, a lot of things happen because this is the general poverty policy. The housing facilities is a regional matter, everything that has to do with energy efficiency, renovation, etc. And when we talk about energy prices, then we have reached a level that is organized on the federal level. So what we can do really has to do with pricing policy, protection of consumers, and also the general uh, policy against poverty. And I would briefly like to talk about some of these concepts in order to explain what we do. First of all, we have the social prices that uh, have been increased uh, on a temporary basis for a number of uh, families. And we're looking at whether perhaps we can make that more permanent. We also have an exercise about the social prices in general to see who could benefit from these lower prices and how this could be financed. And we also look at the energy funds. We have, uh, for example, a special fund for people who use uh, fuel to heat their houses. But of course, we also look at what we can do in the areas of electricity and natural gas to reach as many people as possible. Now, what we also have on a national level is the protection of consumers. This is important for all the consumers, but especially within the context of energy poverty, because this is not only linked to wages, it is also linked to the energy prices, because even the middle class could be in difficulties. So we're now working on a consumer agreement and we are defining a number of practices for the energy market. We're also looking at whether there are any sleeping contracts in order to better understand how we can protect consumers better or how we can motivate consumers to change their contract. We also have the federal plan to combat poverty. This will be presented at the end of this year. And part of it has to do with energy. The minister... Um, in charge of energy and the minister in charge of the fight against poverty will be working together. There will also be a national conference on the just transition that will be organized and obviously energy will play an important role. Several ministers will work together, the minister in charge of poverty, the minister in charge of uh, energy, etc. So this in order to organize this conference on the just transition. But what is uh, really at hand here. We have the European policy and we have received some guiding principles, for example, in order to define energy poverty in Belgium, because we do not have such a definition. We do have the concept of protected consumer, which has to do with the wage which is of these people, but also with their general situation. But we do not have a definition of energy poverty. And this is something that we're really working on now because we want a federal definition and we will also want to define the indicators that can help us with the statistical capacity building. The work of the King Bowden Foundation is extremely useful and we are very happy with the work that has been done. But the federal authorities, Belgium as such, also needs to work with a number of poverty indicators that can be measured and followed up. So this is not something that we can do out of free choice because Europe also wants us to have uh, a number of objectives we first need to look at the energy poverty now, and then we also need to define what we want to achieve on a federal level, but also at the level of the regions. This is extremely interesting because, first of all, there was some fragmentation. The competencies were fragmented, but we now need to work together to get a common definition and a common action plan. So that very briefly was energy poverty on a federal level. Thank you very much. I would now like to talk about the vision of the distribution system operators in the area of the energy transition for it to be just and inclusive. 
As we know, as you know, the context of COVID-19 leads us all to ask the same questions. Are my loved ones healthy? When will I be able to live a more or less normal life? Now, this is a very particular context, of course, and it inevitably leads us to focus on what is happening today, on what is actually constituting our daily life now. And that is understandable. But it is up to all of us to look beyond this horizon, to also look beyond the rules that will be applied next week or what our months of May or June will look like. So we should not be trapped in the short term, because even if the climate challenge is no longer in the headlines, it still is an absolute emergency. We really need to tackle this crisis today. Now, COVID makes us particularly concerned about our elders, but the climate challenge makes us focus on future generations. So that's a lot to take in. That is true, but it is our reality. It is not the one or the other. It's really the two cha challenges that we need to address. And in order to do that, to do something for the elders, but also for future generations, the transition should be there for all of us. For people in Flanders, Wallonia and Brussels, we should all go towards cleaner and more sustainable energy. This is an indispensable step that we have to take without further delay. You will have understood that this is the business of everyone because it is so urgent. So we cannot expect others to show the way. We just have to take steps ourselves. And when I say that we have to do that ourselves, I'm talking about the distribution system uh, operators, but I'm also talking about each and every one of you companies, public institutions and individuals. Everybody must be an actor of change because it is only by adding up those new behaviors that it will be possible to do something on a larger scale and to achieve really something to tackle this emergency. As you can imagine, when it comes to energy, these new behaviors can very quickly have a substantial impact. Now, in the context of what we want to do, you will have understood that the best energy is the energy that we're not using. Now, the topic of today's webinar is that we're not all equal in front of this energy crisis, and we're not all equal in our ability to apply this principle of not using energy or to adopt new cons consumer behavior. The King Baudouin Foundation's barometer, for example, shows that more than one in five Belgian households is living in energy poverty today. And that means that 10% of the population has an energy bill that is too high compared to their income. And 10% uh, has a bill that is too low compared to the um, consumption that one could expect. So they're using less energy because they know that they cannot pay for the energy. And we have had quite mild weather and we've also seen quite low natural gas prices. So this, of course, is not something that people have chosen. This is just something that ha is happening. And it is precisely for this reason that the distribution network operators are advocating towards um, and working towards an inclusive energy transition. The energy transition has to be accessible to all. Now, this is not a matter of societal choice. It is not a question of corporate social responsibility. As uh, distribution network operators, we think that it is an obligation that we have given the urgent context in which you find ourselves. So we do not want a society that runs on two different speeds, people who can afford to produce or consume clean energy because they have the money or because they have the information or the education to do so, and those who would be left behind. We really do not want such a two-tier society in the energy field as in the digital field. We are neutral actors, non-commercial actors, 
and we therefore want to provide access to energy and control of consumption to all citizens. On the other hand, we also want to offer support so that the use of energy can become more sustainable and affordable. And to, in order to achieve these two objectives, we need to organize ourselves and our action around five pillars that complement each other. Now, the first is quite simple. Well, it is quite simple to talk about it. It might be a bit more complex to achieve it. But the first is to just simplify the interactions that we have with our customers by having clear processes and easy uh, communication. This is, uh, of course, especially true for vulnerable consumers. The liberalization of the energy market has uh, really left us with a complex reality and it is quite difficult for some people to find their way around the various players involved. And this is, of course, true for the most vulnerable. And that is why we want to invest a lot of efforts in raising awareness of the need for a more rational use of energy. We want to make sure that the communication is available in several international languages, so not just uh, French and Dutch. We also want to use other international languages so that this communication with respect to a sustainable use of energy can be understood by most people that we are addressing. And we also want to use several channels so that we can be proactive with all groups of users. So we will have a web portal, WhatsApp, text messages, all those means will be used. So in order to summarize this, I could say that we really want to have communication that is as accessible as possible, and therefore we will use a number of international languages, and we will also use different communication channels. The second area is prevention in order to avoid disconnection. It is indeed important that all consumers know their rights and that they can also use them if necessary. And we can do that together with a number of social partners. Of course, we also want to strengthen preventive measures. So we really want to intervene long before people risk a cutoff. For example, when uh, customers do not have a contract or come at the end of the contract and cannot find a new supplier. So it really is important to avoid the most dramatic of situations, which is a cutoff. And here, too, we ensure that communication is clear and that uh, customers, also vulnerable customers, are aware of their rights and possibilities. What we want to do, for example, is uh, make sure that customers in difficulty can contact social players, such as the Centers for uh, public welfare, for example. This is important because these people do not necessarily know how they can get help in the area of energy. Another important element here is that we can avoid a cutoff by uh, having a social supply. So this is prevention. We really want to avoid uh, the dramatic um, consequence of a cutoff. A third area is that we can also intensively work with a number of players, suppliers, regulators, but also social players, as you will have understood. Indeed, we need to work together on a regional level for the distribution system operators, but also on a federal level, because uh, we've just uh, heard that it is quite a complex matter, so it is extremely important that we work together to solve as many problems as possible. The distribution system operators want to play a leading role in the smooth functioning of the market. And uh, in this context, we want to take part in a number of initiatives launched by regulators, public authorities or social players. They want to provide their global vision of the processes, and that is really important. 
because we have the production and we have the distribution, transport, etc. And it really is important that uh, all the information can be made available. So we can offer solutions. We hope that these solutions will be innovative, but also pragmatic, so that we can really play that fundamental role to fight against energy poverty. We want to give information to citizens or to social players so that a number of people can really be taken out of such a situation of energy poverty. Fourthly, we also take on the role of social supplier in a humane manner with a view to becoming the reference supplier for precarious customers, people who are experiencing difficulties. Our role as distribution system operators is to help them by establishing a relationship of trust with the various centers for social welfare, for example. That is our ambition. We want to be not a supplier of the last resort. It is not that people come to us because they have no other solution. No, we want to play a proactive role and we want to establish and maintain a relationship of trust so that we can be the reference supplier for these customers. We really want to help our consumers to better understand their rights and possibilities. And then finally, this is quite new, we propose simple tools to monitor consumption so that people can better control and therefore reduce their energy bill. It is important to understand that consumers are not always aware of what they spend. And this is not only true for people who are in a precarious situation. People do not know whether their consumption is uh, a standard consumption or whether they consume more than the average uh, household or less. The King Bowden Foundation indeed mentioned that this can play a role in uh, energy poverty. So it is important to have a number of simple tools available, an app on a smartphone, for example, so that people can uh, monitor their um, consumption. And they should also understand what that means in euros. That makes it possible for them to have a very clear idea of their situation, and they can then also improve their situation. Of course, it is also possible to work together with somebody who helps uh, you to save energy, a neighbor, for example, or a social player. That person can then look at the information and will be able to help you a lot sooner. And uh, not just when you've um, really tried out all the different suppliers and you just uh, arrive at a distribution system operator because you have so many debts and there's no other solution left. Simple tools, therefore, very simple tools, very understandable tools, so that people understand their consumption and so that they can change their uh, behavior and control their budget. So a lot of measures, simple measures, where communication is important, but uh, in which context it is also important to establish a relationship of trust. And it is thanks to these measures that it will be possible to be part of this transition process towards a new way of consuming energy, a just, sustainable and inclusive energy transition. That is the ambition. So the climate uh, emergency requires us all to review the role that we have been playing for a long time. A distribution system operator in 2021 cannot just simply distribute energy, even though this is the core task, but it is not enough. We also have a role to share knowledge, and we really want to take on this role. We want to make people aware of the impact of their energy consumption. And it is therefore that a number of uh, information platforms have been launched, neutral and independent energy energy information platforms, informative magazines, newsletters and ebooks, and a number of other initiatives as well, because it is important that people become more aware of the situation so that they can use energy in a more intelligent and responsible way. That is now an integral part of our mission. 
We want to help people to reduce their bills, but also their ecological footprint. And that is really what we want to contribute to in an active way. And we want to do it in a fast and inclusive manner. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having organized this event. I am Irio and I work uh, in the area of um, energy. I would like to talk about the European policy, European framework. And I think that uh, energy poverty is really part of the policy of the Commission and it is also part of the European Green Deal. European Green Deal, which uh, has clearly shown that it is important to do something in an inclusive way. It is important to come to a more sustainable, to a green um, energy for the well-being of everybody. The Commission has uh, worked on a number of tangible projects in order to make progress in this area. In especially to achieve or help achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. A lot of uh, work has already been done and will continue to be done within the context of this strategy to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. So this is a political program that really wants to mainstream the Sustainable Development Goals in all the different policy areas. There are 17 Sustainable Development Goals, and we will find them in the six uh, major ambitions that uh, Mrs. van der Leyen has identified. So the Green Deal is a new strategy, a strategy for growth in Europe, and it will be coming out from the ordinary budget. And there will also be a relaunch after the pandemic. So in the longer run, the this will be taken into account for the next generation EU that will be boosting the relaunch. This is an important project for Europe and it will go further than what we've seen in the past. So we are talking here about 1,800 billion euros to relaunch Europe after COVID-19. The idea is, of course, to have a greener Europe and to also work in the digital field. We will have more flexibility in our mechanisms also to de deal with um, specific situations. And then we can think about the reality that we're facing today, but also other situations that can see the light of day in the future. Now, one of the major elements is that we want a just a fair energy transition. And we have a just transition fund in order to help us. The different member states, Belgium as well, will need to establish a number of transitional plans in line with the climate ambitions of the European Union and also in line with their national action plans on the climate and energy. So this is uh, what is going on right now. So I think that we will have those plans in May or in June. What is also important is that uh, the public opinion supports this uh, energy transition. The Euro barometer clearly shows that nine Europeans in 10 agree that uh, it is important to have access to clean energy. 
there can be some resistance. And if there is resistance, of course, the process might be slowed down because we all know what has already happened in France. It really is important to have that public support. And I think that it was mentioned earlier as well. The Commission has launched a number of tools for the different stakeholders in order to make it possible to come to a just transition. So we're talking about uh, renewables, we're talking about uh, renovation of uh, buildings, etc. So very tangible ideas. And we have a number of tools. We have, for example, the Forum for Citizens in the context of uh, energy. We also have the Convention of Mayors for Energy and Climate, in which participates uh, Brussels, for example, but also a number of other cities in Belgium. And then we also have the uh, Pact for the Climate that was launched last year. So a number of initiatives that are very transparent, that are accessible, and that will make it possible for the European citizens to play an important role in the energy transition. experience and insight is also important for people. They are essential for people to accept this transition. We know that uh, energy represents 75% of the emissions within the European Union, so it is uh, really important to do something about the energy transition. Some sectors might indeed uh, become less important or they might even disappear, whereas other sectors will uh, grow or will come into being. This transition can bring with it fears. It uh, has uh, some characteristics that uh, will break down our uh, riches and wealth, or at least that is the impression that one could have. But nothing is less true than that. If we look at uh, renewable energy, for example, 500,000 jobs will be created uh, before 2050, and that is a lot more than the jobs that will disappear in the area of fossil fuels. And of course, it's not just... Uh, something that is important from an economic point of view. It should also improve people's welfare. And it is important that no one is left behind. I think that we all understand um, the consequences in the area of public health, for example, through the quality of the air in the major cities. So this is also something that we want to contribute to by this uh, Just Transition and the Just Transition Fund and all the other initiatives that we take against energy poverty. The fight against energy poverty is a very important part of this transition. It is important that the transition be just, and therefore it is important to do something about the inefficiency from an energy point of view of a number of housing facilities. The Commission is trying to understand where energy poverty comes from and to fight it within the European Union as a whole. And therefore, it has introduced a number of obligations, for example, an obligation to identify energy poverty and to do something about it. Last year, the Commission has also formulated a recommendation. The objective is to get a clear definition and a clear follow-up of the different member states by combining a number of indicators and by making sure that good practices are exchanged between the different member states. One of the recommendations is also to have a systematic approach of uh, freeing up the market. The economic and social policy can play a role here. It is important that we have the right targets, also from a social point of view. And it is important also to have a good program in the field of financing all these different initiatives. 
And then finally, it is essential that the companies and authorities are considered as actors of change, as are individuals and households. That is where major energy savings can indeed be achieved. It, next, we also have the Observatory for Energy Poverty in Europe that was set up and that also plays an essential role to accelerate this transition and to also add to the recommendations. This year, a second phase of the observatory will start. We are going to make further progress. We will continue to work with it. Up to now, we've just collected information. Um, but now we are also going to implement a number of things that will also be essential. I, I wanted to say something about the role of the distribution system operators because, of course, they do have an important role to play. These operators can play a role in the reliability of supply in innovation, etc. We think that they should also make it possible to introduce new and innov innovative technologies to reduce the cost of energy. To give you an example, we have uh, smart meters, for example. Smart meters are extremely important because once they've been installed, it is possible to use a number of services. And I can give you just one example. I am Finnish and my mother, who's 88, lives in Finland. She's got such a smart meter. And I was talking with her like last year when we were speaking about energy and she was talking about uh, her annual bill, etc. And uh, I told her that it was important to try to reduce the bill through a dynamic contract. She did that. And uh, at the end of the year, she called me and she said, well, thank you very much. I've now saved 350 euros without really changing my habits, but just by playing with the prices on the market. So the tools exist and you can use them in order to save money. And it really is up to the system operators to play a role in this. And then to conclude, I also wanted to say something about the private side of things. We do have interesting examples that we found also in Belgium regarding the partnerships between the public and private sectors and NGOs. We have an example in Flanders, the project Papillon, with a collaboration between a local NGO and uh, a well-known um, household supplier and a local authority in order to organize energy audits. That was the major idea, energy audits, especially for households living in a precarious situation. These uh, families could receive uh, household appliances. It's a well-known brand, but I won't uh, mention it here. But they could use them to try out a number of things. And the results were really fabulous. The observatory indeed uh, gives us information about some of these uh, examples in Belgium. So it is important to also include the private sector. Also, the impact of uh, investors is important. We have a Belgian supermarket, for example, that is also active in this field. Thank you very much for your attention. The first question is for The first question is a question for me. Would it be possible to reduce the social price by a premium or a bonus based on the budget of the household instead of uh, on the category? And what 
is the role of NGOs in this? So can they play a role? Well, the short answer is yes. The longer answer is that for the time being, we use social prices depending on the situation of families. Families can, for example, receive help from the centers for social welfare, or they might get a, a um, benefit, social benefit. If that is the case, they can also uh, benefit from lower energy prices. So there will be some um, element of uh, household income that will be taken into account, but it's not just that. Now, you might know that we are currently really working on this situation on a federal level, and we're really um, starting from scratch and we're analyzing the whole situation. Who can benefit from lower prices? Are these the right people? How can we target uh, these people best? And perhaps a number of things can be done in a more efficient way. So, yes, this is certainly something that we're working on. Thank you for the question. So, does the Commission foresee to finance projects active in green transition with a focus on energy poverty, like special citizen communities? Well, again, the reply is yes, indeed. Uh, there are a number of different uh, um, funds, actually, which go into this direction. So when we talk about communities, so energy communities, uh, both renewable energy communities, communities and citizens' energy committees, uh, communities, um, both are supported, uh, first by legislation and now also by, by financing. Uh, and uh, the goal, and, and the one very important thing about this is that actually we have seen that uh, these kinds of communities generally are very favorable to the energy poor. And why? Because they often have a social vocation. They have other, um, they are driven by a bit of a different business model than, than normal retailers. And therefore, usually the margins are lower. And, and that means that there is a benefit to the, uh, um, to the, uh, uh, to the energy poor. So the answer indeed is yes. And I would expect that some of these famous uh, recovery and resilience plans that the member states are presenting. So they will hopefully con contain issues like that and then can be financed. The next question is a question for me, but I would also like to react to what Ira was just saying. On a Belgian federal level, we're also working on the definition of energy communities and what that can mean for our country. The next question has to do with energy poverty. Energy poverty is caused by the high energy prices, especially for electricity with a lot of taxes that uh, are also part of the prices. So what would be the best thing to do? Reduce the prices or uh, take measures to reduce the use of energy? I think that the, the second uh, answer is the best. We do have reduced prices, but this is something that is just going to work on the symptoms. People live in energy poverty, they have a lot of debts, and they can benefit from reduced prices. But it is a lot more sustainable to help these people in the long run. So from a federal point of view, we can't do anything about energy efficiency, but there's a lot of other things that we can do to motivate the Belgian population in order for them to use appliances that are more energy savvy. The next question is for me. Given the energy poverty, people who live in a precarious situation should consume less, but that is perhaps too easy as an answer. It might be, and it is not the only answer that we want to offer. But rational use of energy is essential. Of course, it is not just about people who live in precarious situations. I think that the best uh, uh, use of energy is not using energy. And I think that that is true for all consumers, not just for consumers who live in a precarious situation. Now, we have a number of things that we can do in order to achieve the energy transition. We've been talking about uh, that. And uh, one of the things that we can do has to do with energy communities. 
which means that uh, we would actually look at our own consumption. Now, it might seem a bit barbaric, but what is it really about? It is about uh, producing one's own energy, for example, through solar panels or a heat pump, and that uh, energy can then be used up by this whole community. What does that have to do with energy poverty? Well, it is quite simple. People who live in a difficult situation might not have a house that uh, is appropriate to produce energy or they might not have all the information that they need in order to use solar panels, for example. But these solar panels could be installed by the owner of uh, a flat. How can we make sure that people who live in a more vulnerable situation can still be part of the energy transition? Well, we can make sure sure that they're part of such an energy community. That is a very clear idea. And we have a number of pilot projects in Brussels. People who live in poverty in Brussels will also be invited to be part of these energy communities. And in that way, they can also contribute to the energy transition. What I also wanted to say about this is the following. One of the major driving forces to achieve the energy transition is something that the distribution system operators are really following up very closely. I live in St. Jill and a lot of buildings were built before 1972. So you can imagine the situation. They are quite prestigious from a heritage point of view, but if you look at it from an energy point of view, They are not very energy efficient, so it is quite difficult to reduce one's consumption in these buildings. And now the federal and regional authorities are drawing up plans to renovate all these buildings. So that is also part of the relaunch plan of the federal government. We think that this is also something that could be part of the transition But, of course, it is essential that people can participate in such projects through these communities. I'd like to insist upon that once again. It is essential to give good information. Information should be presented in a pragmatic way. Citizens, people should really get the best information possible. And it is also essential to work together with other social players. Because there's not just one solution, there are a number of measures that can be taken at various levels, national level, but also the regional level, the local authorities can do something, and also Europe, of course. The challenges are so big that we really should not be afraid that we might cause difficulties for um, each other. This is the final intervention of this webinar. Energy transition is something that we should work on on an everyday basis without leaving anyone behind. So yes, the fight against energy poverty is extremely important, but it is also a very complex problem, as I'm sure you've heard this afternoon. I would like to thank the three speakers, Mrs. Fauconnier, Mr. Irio, and also the representative of the minister. Thank you very much. And uh, we would like to close our webinar here, but it is not the last webinar that we will organize because we're the ambassadors of SDG Voice for 2021, and we will organize another webinar on the 24th of June. We will then invite Mr. Thomas Dermin, and we will also have Mr. Pascal de Buc and Mr. Fernand Griffney, and they will also speak about uh, how the distribution system operators can play a role. Thank you very much for your attention.